I invite you now to stand as you are able as we join together in our words of greeting. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come preaching to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Please remain standing now as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 154, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. We are a creedal church, and we say what we believe every Sunday. I invite you now to join us in this historic statement of faith, the Apostles' Creed, found printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As you are settling back into your seats, I want to draw your attention this morning to our At Huntsville First. Um, as always, there's so much going on in the life of our church, but I want uh, to focus our attention this morning on our upcoming Go Missions Conference, happening the weekend of February 8th, 9th, and 10th. There will be a missions dinner over in the Wesley Center on Friday, February 8th. We will be hearing from a bunch of our missions partners how our faith um, promises have helped them over the past year in their ministries. So we encourage you to come be a part of that. We're catering the food from Terra Nova's Italian restaurant. It's $6 per person or a $20 cap for families. And there will be childcare provided for that. And then on Saturday, um, February 9th, we are going to get out of our seats and into the streets. We have mission projects um, for everyone. There's all kinds of opportunities to serve, from the downtown rescue mission to Mana House. We'll also be packing hygiene kits and backpacks here at the church. So I encourage you to participate in that in any way you can. And if you just are overzealous and really want to get started now, if you've noticed, there are some flood buckets throughout the um, lobby areas in the church, and you're welcome to pick one of those up and take it home with you today. There are um, items um, in the bucket that we request that you purchase and bring back in the bucket, and you can bring those back before February 9th, and we'll get those over to the Disaster Relief Warehouse. And lastly, our Faith Promise Pledge Sunday will be February 10th, and we will have some mission partners here with us that Sunday morning um, talking about how our pledges have helped in their ministries. If you want to register for the meal or for service projects, you can do so on the church website. If you'll go to the serve tab, scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's out of the seats and into the streets. If you click on that link, you can register for both dinner and mission sites there. So I encourage you um, like I said, to be a part of that day as we serve our city. As we move into our time of prayer this morning, I have a few requests I'd like to bring to your attention. The first is, are the families of Fred Gilmore and Hal Chafin as they were laid to rest yesterday. We also want to remember Bill Probst, who's currently a patient at Vanderbilt, and Jack Lee, who is in UAB Hospital. And we also want to remember Judy Esslinger as she needs prayers for healing. We want to remember our students and our chaperones who are on the youth uh, ski trip this weekend, as well as all of those who were affected by the tornadoes in Wetumpka yesterday. So will you go with me to the Lord in prayer? <coughs> Gracious God, we gather before you this morning longing to experience your presence. We invite you into our lives, into this space, into our hearts, 
this day. Father, we thank you for the gift of faith. For our faith brings us such great comfort. It gives us hope and confidence for the days ahead. However, Lord, we also know that sometimes we can become too comfortable in our faith, even to the point of complacency. And so we ask this morning, Lord, that you would search our hearts, that you would convict us of any complacency we may have in our faith, and that you would restore to us the joy of your salvation this day. Renew us now, Father, in our faith as only you can. And we lift up to you this day those around us who are hurting, those who are struggling, those who are in desperate need of healing. We lift up to you this day those who are lonely, those who are lost, and those who are in desperate need of the comfort that comes only through the faith found in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to live out our faith by stepping out in faith to love and serve those you place before us. We ask these things this day in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture passage is from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, which may be found on page 88 of the New Testament of your Pew Bible. Please stand as you are able for the reading of God's word. This is the story of Jesus' first miracle when he changed water into wine. On the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now six stone jars were standing there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. When the steward of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, The steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'd like to start with a moment of personal privilege before we get into the sermon. I have to say what a blessing it's been so many years for me to be able to stand up here and bring and proclaim the word of God to you. So many of you have been a blessing to me. Just to see you here today has been a blessing. It's great to see Bob McNabb. We, we were been praying for you this week. He's, he's back. He's doing well. We're praying for Bill Prost, who I've heard just today has made it back to Huntsville. I've heard Bill, uh, Fred McLaurin. We've been praying for him. He's back where um, he belongs at Thrive. We have visitors. I welcome all of you that are here. Visitors, I've learned, who have traveled all the way here from Oregon are are here today with us. We're glad to have you. But I especially want to thank Sheriff Dorning, who's sitting here with us today. Today, this week, was the change of of, uh, command ceremony where he's no longer our sheriff. But, sir, I have to thank you so much for your years of selfless service. I have felt safer in this town knowing where you were. Thank you for your many years of service. Now, would you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Famous passage. 
turning water into wine. I have to admit that I was excited about this passage when I learned this is what I'd be able to preach about today. And I wrote a wonderful sermon, I thought. I mean, the kind of sermon that if I was to turn this in at the pseudo-seminary that I go to, uh, to to help train me to do this job, I was confident I was going to get an A. I mean, I had done the exegesis. I got this thing down. I was really excited about this. I mean, I was going to start. This seems like the strangest miracle in the Bible. It's the first miracle, but it's the strangest one to me. I mean, Jesus is at a wedding. Right? And, and they, they run out of wine, and so they bring this problem to him, and apparently the wedding needed something like 120 to 180 gallons of wine, and so he gets these big old jars filled up, each that holds 20 or 30 gallons of water, and he converts them all to wine. But, of course, it's supposed to seem odd at the surface. With John, it's always odd at the surface. You go deeper, there's a deeper meaning. There's always something more going on here. And I had done the exegesis, and I was ready to get into how this represented a transformation from old life, which the water represented, to new life, which the wine represented. And there was a high Christology that's going on here. Mary is never named. She's only called woman. There was this transformation of the Jewish tradition. The pots were used to cleanse people before they could eat and this represented a transformation in the Jewish uh, custom oh I was ready to go in fact I kind of just gave it to you but you know I, I was convicted when I was talking to Pastor Drew who helped put together the sermon series that we're going through here that this had to be about getting out of your comfort zone and I swear I could not connect what I just told you to getting out of your comfort zone so like many pastors unfortunately I had to tear that whole thing up and start over and I was stuck I mean I was really stuck I didn't know how to connect the two together I mean really turning water into wine at a wedding reception I just couldn't get that into getting out of your comfort zone and there's a miracle y'all know I'm a physicist right so for a physicist to talk about a miracle, well, you can imagine the challenge that, that most physicists would face in this position. It would be like an Auburn fan saying, I'm going to become an Alabama fan now. I mean, that, that's kind of what I was looking at. So I listened, and I prayed, and Sunday kept getting closer, and I didn't have my sermon yet. I wish I could tell you that every time we stand in the pulpit with a message that we've got it instantly and we can pull out a sermon anytime. It doesn't work like that. At least it doesn't work like that for me, Britton. No, she doesn't. It doesn't work like that for her either. Okay. Whew. So, I laid it before God. I said, I have a sermon that I need to preach. It's got to be about getting out of your comfort zone. Help. And patiently, listening, a message started to come. So that's what I'm going to share with you. I hope I get it right. Let's start at the beginning. I hope you've got your Bibles with you. You're probably going to keep your thumb in John 2 because I'm going to refer to it a few times. Did you notice how the miracle started? It's really interesting. It started in verse 3 when Jesus' mother, who is never named in the whole Gospel of John, she is always called Jesus' mother, came to him and said, they have no more wine. Now, I don't know about y'all, but at home we often have, um, let's say, communication challenges. When I hear a statement like that, it doesn't sound like a question. It sounds like a statement of fact. And I don't realize that means I'm supposed to do something. <laughs> well, apparently that's how Jesus heard this too. That we have no more wine. This is not a request. This is just a statement of a situation. Okay, what's this got to do with me? He responds. <laughs> what she was doing was laying the problem before him, leaving it to him to decide what to do. And I have to admit, I noticed that because that's exactly where I was with this sermon. I didn't know what to do, and so I laid it before him, and then this came. But I want to ask you to consider, how does it change things for you? If instead of telling God what needs to be done, you lay the situation before him and you ask him to take over. Because that's what happened. That's what happened here. How would it change things? 
if you prayed, I have cancer, instead of praying, cure my cancer? How would it change things if, if you prayed, I'm losing my job, instead of praying, fix my job? How would it change things if you prayed, a loved one is drifting away, instead of praying, fix their problem? I was going to say, how would it change things if you prayed my children are nuts, but I don't need to go there. You understand both kinds of prayers are fine. And you should feel comfortable praying either kind. But which of the two puts it in God's hands? What happens next? Which of the two trusts God with a better perspective on what needs to be done? Lay it before him. I'll give you an example. Some of you know about this. We've talked about it some, I'll say it openly. My job on the arsenal seems to be going away. I'm not sure what the future holds for us. And for months, we have been praying, God, fix this problem. God, we want to stay. We were telling God what we wanted, and I, all we had to show for it was months of frustration and a lot of questions about what's going on. But recently, my prayers have changed, and I have been praying. My job went away. What's next? And I have to tell you, I'm not frustrated anymore. In fact, I'm glad that it's been delayed. I'm glad I'm still here, and I hope it's for some time longer. But get out of your comfort zone with this kind of prayer. That's what Jesus' mother did. Lay the situation before him and ask him to decide what to do. I can tell you there is an incredible peace that comes when you lay it down and let him take it up. And everything else that happened in this story that was read to us by Cheryl was by Jesus' initiative, not by his mother's. Don't you want that kind of control, to have that kind of presence of Jesus Christ in your life that was the first thing number two second thing I heard did you notice what his mother said next okay this is verse five now in chapter two his mother said to his servants hear this do whatever he tells you hmm. easier said than done right now in the story Jesus has instructions right away. He says, get those jars, fill them to the brim with water, bring them to me, draw some out, take it to the master. The master gets the water that's been turned into wine, and he says, you've saved the best for last. Clear instructions, point by point, from Jesus about what to do. I would love it if it happened like that every time. I have to admit, it rarely happens that clearly, with point by point instructions exactly about what to do. I have to admit, it's often very difficult for me to know what Jesus wants to have happen in the situation. And you have to have patience, and you have to learn how to hear, and it takes a while, and it is frustrating. Oh, I wish he could send text messages, <laughs> or use social media. Have y'all seen that show, God Friended Me, that comes on Sunday night, where they get friend requests each week from God, and they have to go act on it? Boy, if I had Jesus at my Facebook, I would be in good shape. I would know what to do. But I don't hear it that way. I wish I had a good answer for you about this. The best I can offer is that you got to be still. you got to be listening. you got to be quiet. you got to give God a chance to speak. And it doesn't always happen on your schedule. And it can be frustrating. I admit that. But I have learned, even if it takes days, weeks, months, even years to hear the message, if God wants you to hear it, you're going to hear it multiple ways. You will get confirmation. You'll be sure. Patricia and I are here today because we got that kind of message in 2005 to move here from North Carolina. And it's given me confidence ever since that I'm doing what God wants me to do. And I pray that that confidence will come to you with whatever question you lay before God. In my experience, the hardest part about that is separating the message you're bombarded with all the time, the message from society you're completely surrounded by, 
how to shut that off so that you can give God a chance. It is so hard to do that. The message of society is simple. Live as long as you can, as happily as you can. It comes in a lot of different forms, but that's basically it, isn't it? When you say, I mean, that's kind of the message. Make it all about me for as long as possible. And I have to admit, it's so often the case when I pray, I pray like society has taught me to pray, Lord, make me happier. Give me what I want. Lord, fix all the illnesses in all the people. Make them live longer. I mean, those are great prayers. But boy, it shows where I'm listening, doesn't it? That I'm listening to society. And I have to tell you this story. I've been holding this story. I hope this is the right time to share it with you. This is something that happened to me six years ago this month. I was on a mini sabbatical at Rice. And I was doing some research with some scientists there. And the graduate students and I would always get lunch together out in the lawn. And even in January, it's warm enough in Houston, you can eat outside. So we'd eat outside every day, the graduate students and I. And, and I got to know the students, and there was one student who was an atheist, a rabid atheist. And another student who was a Mormon. And he had come to graduate school after finishing his missionary trip. You know how they have to go do missionary work for a year or two. And I love to see them two get into it. It was, it was hilarious to sit there. And, and the atheist was really interesting. He, he was a big fitness fan. He loved to ride his bike all around Houston, which I thought was crazy. But he loved to ride his bike around Houston. He exercised all the time. He would go to the gym. He was Mr. Fitness. One day the Mormon asked him, he said, why are you doing all that fitness stuff? Oh, because I want to live longer. Don't you want to live longer? I mean, healthy people live longer. And the Mormon, I just love this. The Mormon said, what would you say if I told you a way you could have eternal life? <laughs> All right. I wish I had thought to say that. Put yourself in the creator's shoes. Which kind of prayer do you think he likes more? Make me happier? Or make me an instrument of your peace. Which kind of prayer do you think God likes to hear more? Let me live longer? Or give me a cross that I may take it up and follow you? Talk about getting out of your comfort zone. What a tough prayer that is to pray. Yet I know that's what we're supposed to pray. Because, you know, be realistic. The cancer may not be curable. It might be. I hope so. The job may not be fixable. It might be. I hope so. The loved one that's slipping away may never return. I hope not. Regardless of what answer you get, find a way to do whatever Jesus says. Do whatever he says. And he'll give you a path for it. It may be a different path than you're used to. I mean, look at the jar. Right? These were jars used for the Jewish purification at the meal. When he turned that water into wine, they no longer could be used for what they had always been used for. They had to be used for something new. Which leads us to the final observation, the third point. Why did he do it anyway? Why did he turn water into wine anyway? What was the point? I don't think he needed it because the party needed wine. I'm sorry. I just don't think that was the reason. In fact, I don't think we're supposed to think that was the reason the way the scripture was led, read. It was the superficial, wrong understanding that so often happens in John. There's a deeper reason that you're supposed to go and find. It's interesting, if you know anything about the Gospel of John, that in the Gospel of John, Jesus does not perform miracles. He performs signs. What's the difference? A sign is a miracle with a purpose. It is an opportunity for Jesus to teach an important lesson. This was the first sign that Jesus performed. This miracle had a reason. We are supposed to figure out what that reason was. What was it? It says. To tell us who he was. Now, how did that work? How did turning water into wine 
do what it says in verse 11. This was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. How did turning water into wine reveal his glory? So much so that his disciples believed in him. What, what, how did that happen? What's really odd about this story is he did it in private. Did you catch that? When the, wine, when the, the, the master of the banquet drove out the, the wine, he didn't know where it came from. And he went and thanked the groom for it. He didn't know it was Jesus' doing. He had no idea. And what's really weird is the servants didn't correct him. So if this is about revealing Jesus' glory, how is it that him doing it in private did that? Hmm. I mean, why didn't he do it in front of everybody? Why didn't he get up in front of the whole wedding and say, Hey, I hear you all out of wine. Watch this. I mean, if he stood here in this pulpit and did that, man, we would follow him. We would believe in his glory, right? We want that kind of miracle. Sometimes we need that when our faith is weakest. We need to see something like that happen. So how did it happen that him doing this in private revealed his glory? So this is one of two signs that are companion signs in the Gospel of John. You have to turn over to chapter 6 to see the other part. This is a, mirror, a sign that Jesus performed when he fed the 5,000. We know that story. It's recorded in all four Gospels. And he, this is where he talks about, I am the bread of life. I am the bread sent down from heaven. And the people are all fed. This one he did publicly. Everybody saw it. Everybody understood that this was a, a sign that had been performed among them. But then Jesus leaves in chapter 6. After that feeding of the 5,000, he leaves. He goes away. And the people look after him. They chase after him. They try to find out where he went. And when they show up, they say, do it again. And Jesus knows their hearts. And he says, very truly, this is verse 26 of chapter 6. He says, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. In other words, you just wanted the bread. You missed the point. This was a sign. This wasn't just about feeding you. This is about revealing who I am. And of course, that's what would have happened at the wedding, too, if he had done it in front of everybody. They just said, hey, do that again. That was cool. Could you turn my dessert into chocolate cake? Huh? Could you come over to my house and do that? That was great. I want, other, I want my friends to see what you just did. That's how we all would have reacted. Jesus didn't come here to do parlor tricks. He didn't come here to solve the wedding banquet's problem. He came to show us how much God loves us. That's it. That's the point of the passage. That's the point of the, of the sign he performed. Give God the glory, no matter what. Whether or not you can explain it, give God the glory. That's what this was all about. I know you've received miracles, every one of you. Some of you have received miracles that you can't explain. Miracles that defy scientific explanation. I bet you've received a whole lot more that can be explained. But you never thought of them as miracles before. And I'm sure you've thanked God over and over again for those unexpected miracles you've gotten. But have you ever thanked God and given God the glory for the expected miracles that happened in your life? Have you ever thanked God for the medicine and the doctors that are available to deal with whatever medical problem you bring before them? Even if they can't solve it, at least you know you've gone to the best place you can and you've gotten the right answer, the best answer that we can give you. If you don't consider that a miracle, imagine if you had been in the same situation 50 or 100 years ago when that didn't exist. It is a miracle that we are living in this time right now. Thanks be to God for the miracle of medical science. Have you ever thanked God that at some point in your life, somebody valued you so much that they offered you a job and were willing to pay for you to live for a period of time because you were so important to them? Have you ever considered that a miracle? 
Imagine if you had lived 50 or 100 years ago. Would that job even have existed for you to be hired into? Thanks be to God that people value us that much, that they're willing to hire us. Maybe there's a precious somebody in your life who's drifting away. Have you prayed and thanked God, even if they don't come back, that for a period of time, they were all the world to you? Thank God for that period of time you had with them. Imagine what your life would have been like if they had not been there. Glory be to God for putting those wonderful people in our lives. Even if you've received the worst possible news you could ever hear, praise God. When I was in North Carolina, I went to a McMahon and United Methodist Church. It was a church just down the road from Duke. I went there because it was close to Duke where I was in graduate school. And we had a preacher there. His name was Reverend Michael Hobbs. One of the greatest preachers I ever heard. Truly inspired me. First time I ever got a chance to preach was in that church. He got cancer. But he wasn't going to let that keep him out of the pulpit. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, as cancer was ravaging his body, he struggled with his arms on the rail, pulling himself into the pulpit, leaning over it so that he could support his weight through his weakness as he was balding and nauseous and pale and his voice was cracking and he would say I am being whittled down like Gideon's army so that all that I can give you is God's glory because there's none of me left it's only God and I'm here to proclaim Christ and Christ risen indeed thanks be to God We are to get out of our comfort zone. Stop being afraid. Lay your situation before God. Lay it down. Do what he says. And give God the glory no matter what you hear. Do not fear hardship. Do not fear death even. That has been conquered. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. If there's anything to be afraid of, be afraid of living a life selfishly. Fear a life whose goal is to make God work for you as a solution to your problems. That is not why we were created. We were created for God's purposes. Make your life about glorifying Him with everything you've been given. Don't let the miracles you've experienced just be for your own benefit. Tell God, sign me up. Use these miracles for your purpose. Turn your miracles into signs. You were created by God to serve God. Put Jesus Christ in charge of your life. Don't ask how he can make your life better. Ask how you can make his kingdom better. In every circumstance, give God the glory. Because, friends... You are that miracle waiting to happen. You are that water in that clay jar whose life can be transformed into that better life if you simply do that. Become the wine that you were always meant to be. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of the clay jar and become the wine of life. So that your purpose in life is purely about glorifying God. Let us pray. Lord, we're so good at telling you our problems. As if the most important thing were that you solved them. We confess that. We apologize for that. We've lost perspective of whose we are. We lay ourselves before you. You're created people. For your creation's purpose. We ask that you tell us what you want, teach us how to listen, give us the courage through your Holy Spirit to respond, 
that in everything we do, we may glorify you. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ.